But, um, but yeah, we've often wondered what aliens might look like. A lot of us who are astro nerds love science fiction and, and fantasy that tries to encapsulate these ideas from humans of what aliens could be like. Will they have two arms, two legs like us? Will they look like insects or bugs? Will they fly? How will they move around? We have a lot of weird ideas, but a lot of these ideas come from life as we know it right here on our own planet. Here are two really cool alien looking things that live right here on our world. Two things that themselves have inspired science fiction and our ideas of aliens. If anyone here ever played the video game Mass Effect, uh, this one on the left, the Portuguese man of war, inspired an alien character in Mass Effect. And isopods have inspired lots of characters in lots of science fiction. But they're also cool in other ways. This giant deep sea isopod here on the right, uh, it can be pretty small, but it can also be very large organisms. If you ever have a chance to see one, I highly recommend it. Uh, they have some at the Butterfly Pavilion you know, here in Colorado. And that Portuguese man of war is an organism called a siphonophore. It's not actually a multicellular being like we are. It's actually a colonial organism made up of a, a bunch of different species working together to make the one whole organism function the way it does. And that's just absurd to me. And we have these cool examples of weird alien things. But life on our planet has come to do so many cool things, from, from flying and swimming and growing and moving and eating, all the cool stuff life has done. We have so much biodiversity here on Earth, so many different organisms for us to study. But with this talk, I really want to consider the weirdest creatures, the craziest creatures on our planet, and what they might have to tell us when we start looking for alien life out there. Will alien life be like us, or will it be like the really weird things that we find here on Earth? So for instance, my favorite of the craziest creatures, one I always love starting off with, and this one is a real beast, is the hummingbird. Hummingbirds are beautiful creatures. There's about 300 known species of hummingbird. They're the smallest of all birds. The bee hummingbird can come in at a, at a half of a gram of weight as an adult. Um, and they're gorgeous, but they also make absolutely no sense to me. They really shouldn't be alive. Hummingbirds beat their wings usually about 50 to 200 times per second. Their hearts beat about 1,260 times per minute. They have some really well-developed chest muscles to make their wings move so hard. So if you went to a gym and a hummingbird was in there, it'd be on the bench press for hours just pushing and pushing and building those big pecs up as much as it can. Hummingbirds, they can fly side to side, they can fly forward, they can fly upside down. They're also the only birds that we know of that can fly backwards. And because they, they flap their wings so hard, they actually require a lot of calories for themselves to maintain that high heart rate and all those muscles just beating and beating and beating. Most hummingbirds eat about three to seven calories in nectar a day. Sounds like a small number, right? I mean, we have 2,000 calorie diets. But if you think about the actual mass of those little itty bitty birds compared to us, then a different picture pops out. So if we look at the, the basal metabolic rate, the metabolic rate based on the mass of the organism of a hummingbird compared to us, we see a really weird picture. Hummingbirds consume about 77 times more calories per unit of body weight than what we do. So if you were eating like a hummingbird, you would have to eat about 155,000 calories a day. Oh, don't worry, I'm going to show you how much that is. I grew up in Pennsylvania. There's a place uh, near Clearfield in Pennsylvania called Denny's Beer Barrel Pub. They have the largest cheeseburgers on the planet. This is one of them. This is called the Belly Buster. It's 15 pounds and about 25,000 calories. If you were a hummingbird and you had that kind of metabolism, you would have to eat not just one of these burgers to stay alive every day, you would have to eat six of these burgers every single day just to stay alive. And you actually, if you did the math, are still not quite the whole way there yet. So, you know, top it off with like 10 Diet Cokes or something. Um, but that's a lot of calories. It seems absurd. The hummingbirds are, to me, crazy creatures. And they represent the beauty of our planet, how much life has done 
to adapt to these different environments around our planet. Hummingbirds have become the best pollinators. They fly around so fast from flower to flower to keep sucking down that juice. They're obscene. They're crazy. And so when astrobiologists like myself start looking at life on Earth, we wonder, you know, what kinds of environments might alien life appreciate on our planet? Uh, what kinds of places can we expect to find with alien life on it in other worlds? One way to start making that kind of uh, analysis is to look at the environments we have in our solar system to give us an idea of what to expect out there. Now you might see this is not, the distances here aren't to scale with all the planets. Uh, but let's look at one of the other planets in our solar system. Solar system. Let's start with Venus. Uh, this is a picture from Pioneer. Uh, looking at Venus with your own eyes, you would see a cloud, a cloudy world. Um, Venus is very much like Earth, except it has a very, very thick atmosphere. We can look through the atmosphere using radar, uh, like this Magellan image here on the right looking down at the surface. But if we were to go down there ourselves to stand on the surface of Venus, we'd be in trouble. The surface of Venus is about 850 degrees Fahrenheit and 92 times the surface pressure that we have here. That's way beyond where anything that we know living on Earth can survive. But it tells us there could be environments out there in other worlds that are very hot. So what kinds of life should we expect to find there? Well, it might be life like the extremophiles that we have here on Earth. Uh, this is Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park. If you haven't been there yet, I highly recommend it. It's my favorite spring in the park. Um, and you see in this image that really deep blue water in the middle is around 250 degrees Fahrenheit. But as you move out away from the middle of the, of the pool here, you start seeing all these colorations come in from various organisms living around the edge of this hot spring at temperatures that are way beyond what we can survive at. And they make a living quite well there. And actually, the highest temperature we know of that any organism has survived in is just above 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this organism, Methanopyrus candelari, is the craziest creature for temperature that we know of as far as high temperature is concerned. It's one of the hyperthermophiles. Uh, that high temperature, though, also comes with very high pressure. This thing was isolated from the deep sea floor near hydrothermal vents. There are also organisms on Earth that love cold environments, or at least can survive in cold environments. For instance, the wood, wood frog is pretty crazy. Uh, these organisms can survive the freezing and thawing cycles in the Arctic tundra up in Canada. Uh, as long as less than about, uh, or, or no more than 65% of their body becomes frozen, they actually can survive inside the ice throughout a winter. And we found organisms thriving in ice on glaciers, in various icy environments around the planet, uh, even in, in sub-Arctic, sub-Antarctic lakes. Um, and so some of these organisms might teach us what to look for if we go to places like Mars where the average temperature is negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. It's rather cold on Mars, but we look there for, for trying to find signs of life that might have been there in the past, could be there right now. We use places on Earth and crazy creatures that we find to try to understand Martian environments that might have had life. For instance, this picture on the left right here is me in the Arctic at Borpfjord Pass uh, on Ellesmere Island. I'm standing on top of a deposit rich in metal primarily pyrite, it's iron sulfide. And as that metal is being weathered by water and by the air around it, it's forming this red rock out around. And we're now trying to study the organisms that thrive inside of that kind of material to better understand what might actually be thriving on the surface of Mars or had thrived there in the past. On the right-hand side is a picture from Spain, from the Rio Tinto River. Uh, this river comes from acid mine drainage from a nearby mine. And you see all this red coloration from lots and lots of iron in the fluid. We use this as an analog for what to look for if we ever can find signs of life on Mars. And we're currently looking for those signs. Uh, we have one uh, rover right now uh, active on the surface of Mars. We have Curiosity. Uh, we might hear from Oppy soon, hopefully. I think a lot of us are holding out hope that we'll hear from Opportunity. But uh, as of right now, we know Curiosity is still driving around. One cool thing I like with Curiosity is one of the instruments on board this rover was actually turned on as soon as we launched this spacecraft off the surface of Earth. That instrument was called the Radiation Assessment Detector, or RAD. And its job was to measure the radiation environment going through space to Mars, and then on the surface of Mars as well. And one thing we learned from that is that the radiation environment on Mars and in space going to Mars is higher than we thought before. 
Not so much that we can't send astronauts to Mars, but high enough for us to worry. Because radiation is damaging to our bodies, right? It's not healthy for us to be exposed to lots of ionizing radiation. And yet there are crazy creatures on Earth that can withstand lots of radiation. For instance, the Guinness Book of World Records, uh, most radiation-resistant organism is this little guy, Dinococcus radiodurans. Its name basically means terrible berry who can withstand radiation. Uh, so just like dinosaur, right? Dinosaur means terrible lizard. Uh, that dino is the same thing we have here. And coccyx comes from the old Greek word for berry. So it's a, it's a terrible berry. Kind of looks like a butt. Um, but they are very, very uh, radiation-resistant organisms. We humans, in one chest x-ray, you get about a half a gray of radiation, uh, which isn't a very large number. But we humans can get killed with about five grays. So one, one dose of radiation at five grays can actually kill us. Meanwhile, these guys can withstand over 5,000 grays of radiation. So 1,000 more times than what your body can take, these guys can, can do fine in. But if we talk about radiation and talk about things like extremophiles, uh, these days, all of us have to end up at some point talking about tardigrades. Um, thanks to Cosmos, just thanks to how awesome they are, and the fact that they're everywhere in our backyards, around the country, around the world. Uh, these things have barely changed in the last 540 million years. Uh, and they're also polyextremophiles. They're not quite as radiation resistant as Dinococcus radiodurans, but they can still take about 4,000 grays of radiation before they will die. Um, but they also can, can do a whole bunch of other cool things. They can withstand uh, extremes in temperature, extremes in salt around their bodies. They can also withstand extremes in having fluid around them, specifically losing lots of water. Uh, so in a phase called anhydrobiosis, a tardigrade can basically take all of its flesh and squeeze it into a little ball, blow all of the water outside of itself so it's entirely dry inside, and can withstand being in that dried out form for extremely long periods of time. And then a little bit of water drips on it, it sucks up the water, and it's good to go again. And this is important because it's allowed them to survive in the environment and space. Back in 2007, we had an experiment where some scientists put tardigrades out into the space environment in low Earth orbit for 10 days, brought them back in, and 68% of all of the tardigrades they put out there had still survived and were viable, just a little drip of water on them, and they were fine and ready to, ready to go again. And one idea of why they might have this process going on where they can blow all their water out and survive might be because they get lofted up into the atmosphere and have to survive long transit times through the atmosphere before dropping back down on the land or in some water again. Which makes me wonder if we find gaseous planets out there, gas giants like Jupiter or ice giants like Uranus and Neptune, if we might find living things in their atmospheres. Organisms that have adapted to survive in these gaseous atmosphere environments. In the original cosmos, uh, Carl Sagan spoke about that possibility for Jupiter or a Jupiter-like world. Uh, he had this artist, Adolf Schaller, uh, create some graphics of his idea of what things might look like. In this idea, we have things called floaters, these big bags of gas that float around in this atmosphere. Uh, we have sinkers, things that kind of drop down through the atmosphere. And then we have hunters, these things that fly through the atmosphere, attacking the floaters and the sinkers. It makes me wonder if worlds like Jupiter out there, of those 600 billion planets, might have creatures like our puffer fish here on Earth floating around, using some defense mechanism like spines on themselves to avoid being hunted. But if I talk about Jupiter, I should probably talk about my favorite moon in our solar system, which is Europa. Uh, one of the Galilean moons, one of the first four moons discovered outside of our own moon by Galileo in 1609. Europa is about just slightly smaller than our own moon, and it has this icy crust, as you see up here in this image, with these lines running through it, these linea, as we call them. But then down below that crust is a very voluminous ocean. Right now, we think that icy crust is about maybe six miles or so deep. And then down below that is an ocean maybe 60 to 75 miles deep, which means there's more volume in the ocean of Europa than there is in all the oceans on our planet. But one important thing for astrobiologists is the question then of whether or not there could be life thriving in that liquid environment. And there's if they have hydrothermal vents in the, the subsurface, 
of Europa, might they be like the ones we have here on Earth, those black smokers we have in the bottom of our ocean, where a whole bunch of crazy creatures thrive, things like these giant tube worms, uh, albino crabs, a whole bunch of microorganisms and MNEs, uh, a variety of organisms on Earth have come to thrive in these little oases on the ocean floor created by hydrothermal vents, by black smokers. And honestly, we could probably sit here for hours just talking about how alien most of the deep sea organisms seem to us and how crazy they are. But one of my favorite of the deep sea organisms that's fairly crazy is the blobfish. These guys survive off the coast of Tasmania, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, they swim about 5,000 feet down. And their bodies are much different than the fish we see here at the surface. So fish at the surface, or near the surface, they use gas bladders inside of themselves, basically like ballast we use in submarines, to help themselves to get buoyancy in the water. These guys are in such a deep, high-pressure environment that gas bladders won't work. Instead, they've evolved a very special kind of gelatinous flesh that allows them to maintain their buoyancy just above the seafloor that far down. But because of that gelatinous flesh, they've gained this name of blobfish because we mean humans came along with our trawling nets, took them off of the seafloor in their natural environment and brought them to the surface where they look much different. Unfortunately for the blobfish, in 2013, an online poll voted them the ugliest organism on the planet. And it's just not fair, right? Because we took them out of their natural environment. Because they've adapted to the seafloor. They've adapted to that very special environment. And honestly, if we are going to find alien life out there, it's very likely that that life has adapted to whatever environments are presented to it. Be those environments like Venus, where they're higher temperature, places like Mars that are much colder, but maybe have higher radiation. There's lots of possibilities. But one thing I like to talk about, too, when it comes to crazy creatures and possibilities for, for alien life out there, it's not just the environments, it's not just metabolism or how things get about. It's also how we perceive the world around us. Sometimes we, we, we take for granted how we humans perceive the world. Our senses aren't the only kinds of senses. Not only that, but there are different ways of using our senses. I'll give you an example. Let's talk about hearing. The way that our ears work, the way that we hear, we're listening to vibrations in the air around us. So basically, waves are moving through the air of the sound, and they're hitting your ear. But your ear can actually only hear a certain range of waves coming through the, ear, through the air around us. One really crazy creature is the greater wax moth. It's crazy because of how it hears. So like I said, we have these waves coming in, they're hitting our ears. And the, the distance between, the, the timing between one wave to another is the frequency. Uh, we humans hear about 20 waves per second, or 20 hertz, up to about 20,000 hertz. So we have this small range, around 20,000 hertz of range. But not all organisms are the same. Some have different ranges. And the greater wax moth has the greatest of them all. So things like your, your dog hears better than you. Uh, some organisms don't hear that well at all. Bullfrogs have almost no range of hearing. But dolphins, bats, things that use echolocation, they have to hear very large ranges because they're using their hearing to visualize the world around them. But then something like the greater wax moth, which has a natural predator in a bat, needs to hear even better. It needs to outhear the bat who's trying to echolocate to find out where it's at. And so it's just slightly greater range than what the bat has to hear a little bit better than the bat can to evade being eaten. But that's not the really craziest part of all this for me. What's really crazy about this range of hearing that the greater wax moth has is that it's entirely outside of our range of hearing. So like I said, we hear about 20 to 20,000 hertz. The greater wax moth hears about 50,000 hertz out to 300,000 hertz. So they're actually not hearing what we are hearing at all. They wouldn't hear my voice, at least not the way you're hearing it right now in this room. They wouldn't hear the sound of me clapping. They wouldn't hear tires squealing on the road or a horn honking. But they would hear some things that we emit, like our radio beacons for airplanes. So airplane beacons, uh, aircraft beacons, uh, are around 300,000 hertz. Uh, some of our weather, 
uh, data are being emitted in that kind of medium frequency, low frequency radio range. And the greater wax moth could actually hear that. Uh, and so who knows what they're actually out there hearing all the time. The weird thing is our brains cannot perceive what they're actually hearing. We can use science to figure out where their range is, uh, but we actually can't, can't feel, can't understand what that would be like. So let's talk about another cool creature that has a really weird way of perceiving the world around us than what we do. And that's the mantis shrimp. So mantis shrimp, they're neither mantis nor shrimp, uh, just crustaceans, but they are really beautiful. They also have the coolest vision that we know of, or the coolest color vision of any organism. They have very, very specialized eyes for seeing color. So the way that your eyes work, we have different kinds of cells in our eyes. We have rods and cones. The rods let us see black and white, grays, and let us tell the intensity of the light coming into our eyes. But it's the cones that allow us to pick out color. And you actually only have three different cones inside of your eye, well, most of you. Uh, some humans actually have a fourth one, but it's very rare. Uh, and it's almost only ever women who have it. Uh, but primarily, chances are most of us in this room only have three, and they only see red, green, and blue. But the reason that we see a whole rainbow of colors, the Roy G. Biv of colors, is because we mix those different ranges of red, green, and blue together, and we add in that little bit of intensity from our, our rods, it lets us see our whole rainbow of color. What we call the visible spectrum, right? But other organisms see in different ways. For instance, your dog only has two color receptors. And so it cannot see all the color that you do. It's, it's fairly colorblind compared to humans. Meanwhile, most butterflies have five different cones. So they're seeing a lot of what we're seeing, but they're also seeing other colors as well. But the mantis shrimp is even different. Species of mantis shrimp have between 13 and 16 different color receptors. So not only are they seeing light within our spectrum of light, these different peaks here uh, in color, they're also seeing things that go out into the infrared and the ultraviolet. So they're seeing color, they're seeing light in a way that we cannot physically perceive. We can't imagine what that looks like. Some years ago, the artist Matthew Inman, who writes for The Oatmeal, suggested that that's like having a thermonuclear bomb of light and beauty going off inside of your eyes. It's a pretty cool analogy. Uh, though, unfortunately for this, this cartoon, about a year after he created this graphic, uh, just a few years ago, some new research came out showing that even though mantis shrimp have that huge spectrum of different, different colors they should be seeing, for some reason, there's a few dark areas inside that they're not seeing, and we don't know why yet. And so there's always things for us to learn in the sciences when we're trying to understand these crazy creatures and how they perceive the world around them. Um, but for my part, as an astrobiologist, it's trying to understand these weird things and what they can tell us uh, when we start looking for life out there. What will alien life be like? Will it have metabolisms like we do or like the hummingbird? Will it require almost no energy at all? Uh, how will it get around? These are really important questions for us to ask in the future. Um, now, when I created this talk, I originally had this created for Fisk Planetarium at CU Boulder. Uh, the primary re reason for this talk was to get involved in a conversation with the audience. And so I'd like to do that now, uh, just to have you tell me what your favorite crazy creatures are. What things on Earth do you find just incredible? What inspires you to think more about what alien life might be like based on how life on Earth functions? Our alien invasion sci-fi that kind of came out in the early 1900s. Uh, one of my favorite old sci-fi movies is called Rocket Ship XM. Uh, it's an old Lloyd Bridges film, uh, if you're interested. Black and white, uh, where some astronauts on their way to the moon get hit by a meteor shower that launches them off and they wake up with their, their ship crash landing on Mars. Uh, and when they get there, they find like these old hominid beings who who their civilization is dying out. You know, and that, that was right at a time where humans really, until we started sending spacecraft to Mars, it was really America 9 uh, that really kind of you know, told us that, well, Mars doesn't have that kind of life that we thought it might for over a half a century. Yeah, most of most of the early science fiction stories are before, this is before science fiction. You'd have uh, people going and visiting other planets and 
and they would beat the beans on those plants and stuff, but, you know, it wasn't an invasion, it was, it was a tour. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And uh, I, I think, uh, I think H.G. Wells was the one that started the war of the world, uh, started his theory of the war of the world mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Of course, we can, do, we can do enough damage ourselves. Yeah, we can, we can damage our own world a lot, yeah. yeah. Well, I've said for years that I don't think there's anything in space that could be any stranger than the creatures that we already have on Earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for sure. Particularly when you go to the deep seas and see some of the really weird things. Of course, uh, we haven't mentioned uh, light-emitting creatures, mm -hmm. which we have in the deep, uh, which do that for a variety of reasons. But, uh, yeah, in the insect world and uh, in the deep sea world, I you know I don't think there's anything crazier than what it's already been. Yeah. Yeah. Especially since we, we've explored so little of the ocean floor, and it seems now like every year when a new submarine goes down deeper, we just discover so many new species, and they, they blow our minds every time that there are new things that life has done that we didn't expect to see. So it's, it's always interesting. At those pressures. Too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's down there. yeah. I've got a thought that may be a tiny bit off topic. I've been reading a book by Chris Empey called Encountering Life in the Universe. And um, the, one of the conversations we should have as we're talking about these strange and wacky creatures is also the ethics of how we are going to treat those wild and wacky creatures. Yeah. Especially since we're, we're already having those issues with the life here on Earth. With the alien creatures we have here, whether or not we're we're doing our best and how yeah, we treat yeah. them, you know? no, we've done such a great job. <laughs> yeah. here on we're already planet. having some issues. You know, we still have species going extinct consistently across the planet. You know, almost every day, I hear about more these days. So. Yeah, I ran into a situation a few years ago when I was the alien. Um, I was uh, scuba diving with a buddy, uh, and we were descending down to a wreck, and we got buzzed by a pod of dolphins. And never have I felt so profoundly that I did not belong there. <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, yeah, I've always wanted to go diving with like whale sharks or some other large marine mammals. I think it'd be incredible. I don't know if you guys have seen the, the, the video coming out today uh, online, social media, of uh, the divers in Hawaii who were swimming with the great white shark. No, uh, the largest great white shark that we know of. Uh, it's just it's incredible video to see them with that large organism. I can't imagine feeling so out of place than beside that large of a creature. I felt in. Yeah, I imagine so. Yeah. Oh, I'm uh, An interesting organism, a multicellular, is the planary worm. And everybody studies it in biology, in the first biology course. And it's interesting because you can cut it into uh, numerous pieces, and each piece will regenerate the whole organism. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the things that you're touching on bear importance by talking about how we can send humans and other living things from this planet to faraway places, and particularly the ones that can become basically freeze-dried when they need to be, things like that. It becomes very relevant. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, some years ago, so, so I imagine some of you might actually be members of the Planetary Society. Uh, some years ago, we had a small instrument uh, called the Life Disc that had tardigrades and E. coli and a few other organisms inside of this very small disc. It was going to be launched uh, to Mars to go out to Phobos on a mission called Mars Phobos Grunt. The idea was to go to Phobos, do a sample return from Phobos, and bring it back to Earth. Uh, unfortunately, some of you might know that, that that mission got into orbit and then never left orbit of the Earth, unfortunately. Uh, however, a lot of us want to know, like, can we send organisms like tardigrades and planaria and hydra and some of these other things you know, into, into Mars orbit and back or out into deep space? How will that affect them? Uh, it's a very big question for us in better understanding life. Right? Are, there, are there any non-DNA organisms of any complexity here on Earth? No. Or is everything DNA-based? Yeah, so it's weird. So. Uh, all of life as we know it uses the same biomolecules, the same kinds of amino acids and carbohydrates, and we're all DNA-based life right now. A lot of us are discussing things like, was there an RNA world before DNA, as we know it kind of took over as the primary molecule uh, for carrying information? Uh, with that, there is a caveat. Um, so things like viruses, a lot of you might recall in biology class, we're told that viruses aren't living. Um, but honestly, we're really not sure. 
<laughs> it's really hard. There is no exact definition of life. It's more about characterizing life, trying to figure out what life does and doesn't do. And viruses are one of those that really push us a lot to try to figure out what life is doing because we have these biological machines out there, like viruses, and some of them are RNA-based viruses. Um, so my, my first creature is, I would say, like a python or a boa constrictor because those, those creatures make zero sense to me because like I, when I was probably six or seven, I saw a boa constrictor eat like a huge pig. And like just seeing, just seeing like a snake like that small being able to stretch its mouth out like that, I mean, it blew my mind. Yeah, it's absurd. Uh, there's an image out there you can find of one of them eating a small stag. Uh, so you can actually see the antlers and the body going down through the inside of this this snake. It, has, it looks painful, but they've evolved to basically slowly digest and devour these well, large I, things inside of them. It's just, been, uh, it's absurd. Things of, things of these things eating porcupine. Uh, it's, it's absurd, right? It just, doesn't seem like it's crazy, but life has done so many cool things on our planet. So then we have to think about following again. If we're willing to send out bacteria or telegrades, 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 or tardigrades, sorry, um, into into space, the question is: Just are we going to, if we land them someplace like on Phobos or on Mars, are we not going to introduce an invasive species? It's a great question. We already yeah. Have yeah. Actually, one we of the coolest have. positions at NASA is the Planetary Protection Officer. I mean, there, there's one person whose sole job is to protect the planet. Uh, but it's not just protecting our planet, it's protecting other planets as well. And so actually, when we develop missions to go to Mars, we do a lot of work trying to make sure that we do our best job cleaning everything we can. Yeah. But even then, even our cleanest clean rooms where we assemble our spacecraft, any study of them always shows there's still some amount of microbes and, and stuff inside of these clean rooms. We just can't get rid of life. Uh, and so we've already sent microbes to Mars on a lot of our spacecraft especially in the early days when a lot of our American and Russian spacecraft going to Mars took a lot of microbes along with them. Uh, whether or not they've survived is a question, probably haven't, uh, because of the temperatures, the radiation environment, um, the situation on Mars, but there's definitely been life sent to Mars on our spacecraft. So. Uh, yeah, I remember reading in uh, the late uh, 1960s, uh, the Andromeda strain. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. great book. And uh, one of the comments was uh, that uh, the Russians actually tried two landers on Mars during that time, and they both crashed. And one of the scientists at the time called called uh, those things, uh, he said it in uh, vulgar terms, but the penitentiary for bugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, we definitely sent stuff there. It's crashed with yeah. their probes, it's landed their probes. Um, and so there's not much we can do about it, but now we're trying our best to at least try to sterilize yeah, our space yeah, and to protect any Martian life that might be there. When Apollo 12 brought some uh, samples of the, that the lander we put on the moon, there were still some items on there still alive and living. Yeah, hmm. yeah. microbes are very resilient. Mm -hmm. yeah. Back to the animal concept. So I work as I spend my day life around critters. Yeah. But everybody talks about like animals under the sea are totally weird and make absolutely no sense. But we have so many critters above sea. So like birds, they have a thing called crops. And that's where they store something. They found with birds that are slowly being able to find less and less food, their crops were growing. And it's insane the fact these critters know about it. I'm talking about seeds and their crops are growing. But even like horses, they should not evolutionary be alive. They have horrible digestive systems, but they always make do somehow, maybe live better in the wild than they do with people majority of the time. But it's just interesting to see how, because the people and animals have evolved themselves too. Cows have developed a totally different system of being able to digest our foods. Dogs, they can't eat raw diets anymore because of it. So in a way that people don't adjust to animals and animals adjust to us, we do not have anything to do with a critter they're not going to we're not going to impact them as much. They're going or we're going to impact them more than we realize. And I think it's insane how even critters who are supposed to be wild animals have gotten so used to people like I eyes and lemurs in Madagascar. They hide from people because they know they're going to be sacrificed. And so we've made huge impacts when it comes to even evolution when they're little babies and they're automatically like getting this instinct of, oh, I can't go below a tree line, even though they're technically below tree line animals and it's insane how much we've done to animals. Oh yeah, and we we've grown and evolved with lots of animals. 
Uh, my wife is also a vet tech for a long time. She now works at the Maine Society. Uh, we have a lot of animals of our own. Well, actually, just two dogs now. We've had ferrets in the past and other organisms uh, of our own. And it's just so cool to see how we've helped them to change through time. Because we are like, all dogs are all one species. We see so much variation in all of them, though. Yeah. And there's just so many differences that life, life can do so many different things. Uh, and it's incredible. Uh, it's a very cool idea. Of course. I'm involved with the uh, cave in the world. I do cave exploration. and. Uh, we're very involved with the uh, National Speedological Society with study of extreme mm -hmm. And you may know some of those people, uh, Penny Boston <laughs> of course. and, and uh, um, uh, Hazel uh, Barton. Mm -hmm. um, and they've been very involved in extreme studies. We've got caves in, even here in Colorado, uh, the first one was really discovered in Mexico, where the bacteria in those caves are they're living by reducing sulfur yeah. and they're producing sulfuric acid and so you go in that cave and there's sulfuric acid dripping off the walls because of this mucilaginous bacteria which we named snotites <laughs> it's hanging all over this cave and so we're looking at all those organisms that operate instead of off of photosynthesis or some other energy, they're finding this is a very low energy environment inside of caves, and yet there's all kinds of living things in there. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so a lot of my graduate research was sulfur geochemistry, um, looking at the geochemistry, mineralogy, primarily organisms uh, who are using this, uh, using metabolizing sulfur to make a budget, to, to make a living. Uh, this is a, up in the, oh, is this not turned on anymore? We have a time now. The projector by Timed off. Yeah. Oh well. Um, so I did some work on a glacier up in the Arctic on Ellesmere Island, uh, looking at a deposit of sulfur that comes out of the glacier. Uh, so fluid down below the glacier. And this is probably why I love Europa so much. And I did this work. Uh, is that on Europa we have cracks in the ice, and there might be some fluid from Europa's ocean coming to the surface. So those of us who want to better know if there's life in Europa, find places on Earth where we have fluid coming through glacial ice, <coughs> through Antarctic ice. At my field site, we had sulfide-rich fluids from the subsurface coming up. When they hit the surface, we had organisms metabolizing that sulfide and oxidizing it to make elemental sulfur and then sulfates as well. Uh, very similar organisms to the snides that you're talking about. Uh, and we can look around our planet on the surface, in caves, in the deep subsurface, at organisms that are utilizing the rock chemistry itself to make a living and not using sunlight for photosynthesis, for instance. Uh, and so it's very interesting to see these different environments. Caves are, give us a really cool uh, picture, too, because they're isolated environments where we have you know, a gaseous interior you know, evacuated inside the rock, and it's kind of isolated from the world around it. And that's why we have like blind fish down there and these very weird worms that live in caves, and things like snotites that have created their, their own little micro-ecosystems inside those caves. Yeah? So I have a question. Um, I'm just curious, like, why are we comparing creatures on Earth and saying we think these creatures can be something that's on a different planet? It's a great I, question. And because I, I personally don't understand like, the connection because I feel like we don't understand a lot about um, honestly what's on Earth right now. So how are we saying that's what's going to be on some other planet? Yeah, it's a great question. So we have this problem called the N equals 1 problem. Uh, we only have one example of life, yeah. life right here on our planet. Uh, we have one biosphere that we know of that ever took off. We could be alone in the universe, and that by itself would be staggering and something to learn about. Or it might be that the universe is just abundant and resplendent with life everywhere. And maybe none of it's like us. Maybe we're oddballs. Maybe we're that one little dot on the chart of life that we're like the, the, out in the far left field somewhere. But it seems to a lot of us, though, based on chemistry and physics, that we can at least get a, a rough idea of how life should function. We think that life, if it exists out there, for instance, might not use the same biomolecules. For instance, we have no reason to suspect that aliens would have DNA. And so we shouldn't go out looking for DNA. Because it's a very specific biomolecule for life as we know it. It's very complex. But there are some things that life does that we think other forms of life probably will do as well. Like metabolism. Like taking energy from the environment and helping that energy transition to other forms. Um, and so that's something we think life will do. And if life is anything like us, maybe life also finds ways to move around to increase the amount of food it can bring in. Uh, there's a lot of things we think about when we look at life on our planet, but yeah, maybe we're missing out on a whole bunch of things that life out there is doing. And so until we start finding life, we're kind of left with using what we can look at here on Earth as our best way of, of figuring it out.
I'm going to do July 1st, actually. Well, um, Bill had a question before me, and then I should be next after him. Okay. Uh, I don't have any signs to back this up. It's just a sneaky hunch that I have that well, we're going to discover in the future that life in the universe is exceedingly common. It's everywhere, but it's all going to be monocellular, prokaryotic. When we find it, and it will be extremely rare to find any kind of life that's made the jump to eukaryotic organisms and multicellular organisms. It's just the Function. Yeah, and actually, I think a lot of astrobiologists would agree. A lot of us feel like a lot of life, if it's out there, probably starts off with the very simplest kind of mechanisms, the simplest metabolisms, and probably stays in that one cell state. But we don't know. Maybe there is a lot more advanced life out there. For instance, uh, we mentioned before we started that I host, I co-host this show called Asking Astrobiologist. Uh, in two weeks, I'm going to have Jill Tarter on my show. Uh, some of you might know her from the movie Contact. Uh, she was a character that Jodie Foster played of Ellie Arroway was based on this woman named Jill Tarter, who works at SETI, uh, who's now looking for signs, these techno-signatures of advanced civilizations that might be out there. But maybe we're not going to find them. Maybe most other life in the universe, if it's out there, is very simple life that hasn't figured out how to transmit messages or receive messages yet. So that's, that's a good point. Um, well, one of my... I have a degree in microbiology, and I really enjoyed enjoyed that getting that degree. And one of my favorite things to study were the viruses because they are so strange. Is it an organism, or is it a protein? In the way that they can insert themselves into the human DNA and cause mutations and diseases, and that whole process. And now I work in medicine. So, but my question for you is how you developed your interest and what led you in this direction of study. Oh uh, yeah, um, very long lifetime pursuit, I suppose. Uh, I was an astro nerd as a kid. I loved looking at the stars and asking big questions. Uh, I also loved Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek Next Generation specifically was my show as a kid. Uh, it really got me interested in space exploration and, and asking questions about you know, what alien life could be like. Are we alone? Uh, so science fiction had a big thing to do with it. Uh, when I did go to college, I actually started off studying biology. Uh, I studied biology and chemistry for my first degrees uh, and was really interested in microbiology uh, what all these organisms are doing around our planet and inside of us. You, you might know that you have more cells of other organisms living on you and in you than you do your own cells. And I find that just staggering. Um, you know, we are not who we think we are, right? We, we, we contain multitudes of other things. Um, and so it's incredible, right? And so when it comes to things like viruses, they really force a lot of us who want to know more about life, like what is life, we have to consider things like the viruses, these biological machines that, you know, did they evolve with life as we know it? Have, or did they come from earlier forms of life before DNA life as we know it came around? We really don't know, yeah. uh, because the viruses are, are hard to study. And we're just now kind of getting better technology, better science for really starting to do really good uh, studies of viruses and how they function. Uh, so a lot more becoming there over the years, I'm sure. Um, but it's, it's, it's a fun philosophical pursuit to ask yourself, can we actually define life? There's a... Uh Science fiction illustration I saw, I think I have a book at home, shows all these alien creatures around. There's this guy standing there, kind of a kind of a prospector type guy. And the caption on it is, he says he's from where? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Good <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, just a comment. Um, talking about the diversity, uh, the diversity of life and things of this nature. Um, one thing that I've been trying to study with my students to get them involved in research is characterizing solar systems. And as a, with the data that we have, we're actually finding that our solar system is very, very unusual compared to others. We're finding a lot of solar systems that are predominantly hot Jupiters. Um, we're finding some that have um, uh, Earth-like planets in the habitable zone, but we're talking about a red dwarf star, um, an M-class star. So, you know, when we look at our solar system, it is unusual, and therefore it is conceivable uh, because the split, even the split, uh, between planets, we have terrestrial planets going from zero, zero point three to 1.88 AU, and then the, these Jovian planets that are going from 5.2 to um, whatever it is. But then we look at other solar systems, 
and we're starting to see um, Jovians in the range of 0.3 to 0.4 AU from their from their parent star. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, we have an unusual circumstance. Is that does that mean that our life is unusual? Uh, I don't know. To be honest with you, I don't think anybody does. But I think in addressing your question also is that um, we are starting from what we know. And we've done this in astronomy from the time of the ancient Greeks all the way on. We thought we knew that the Earth was the center of the, of the universe. We thought we knew that the sun was the center, and so on and so forth. But, so that's where we're starting from. Yeah, a few things though with a few caveats. Um, um, one, we're very biased in the solar systems we are finding so quite, far, the star quite. systems. Uh, because we haven't actually been finding star systems for a very long time so That's far. True. Since the mid-90s, and really even then we're only finding a few at a time. Uh, it wasn't until we got Kepler we started finding a lot more. And we only just, just recently launched TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey right. Satellite, which hopefully will discover another 4,000, if not another 20,000, uh, if we're lucky. But we need longer time periods to study the solar systems like ours that are out there. Because of how far away Jupiter and Saturn are, yeah. even if you're transit, transit, transit method, doing transit, transit method, you, right. need, you need a long time to get several transits to get good data. And the world's that far out and they have that long of a period, we need more observing time. Quite right. So we are very biased right now. So the kinds of solar systems we found so far, a lot of the very first ones we found were just the hot Jupiter star systems. The one with the giant worlds very close to their star going really, really fast yeah. around. Because they gave us lots didn't, of data. We didn't, we didn't have the... Uh, technology to detect these smaller planets at that time. But we're now getting there. I know. So we with TESS, with these other, with other, other telescopes we're building right now, with James Webb, we'll find some more. And then some of the other next generation telescopes that might happen, like W First and some of the other ones, uh, there's some really big stuff coming in the future for exoplanet surveys. So we are biased there. Uh, and then one thing, uh, when I was in graduate school, I took a class with Nick Schneider at CU right. Boulder. Oh, wow. Uh, and he made this comment, uh, because you know, he, he started off studying planetary science before 95. Uh, he said, you know, basically everything we thought before we started finding exoplanets about how exoplanets had to behave was wrong. And everything we thought exoplanets couldn't yeah. be, we now know that they can be. Uh, and so he said, you know, you have to watch making these assumptions about what you know about exoplanets uh, until we start finding more of them and having more data. It is very true. Um, however, another caveat too. Uh, so Peter Ward and Don Brownlee uh, some years back wrote a book called Rare Earth. Uh, where they argued that the very specific instances that we have for life on our planet, a very large moon relative to its rocky world, a large world like Jupiter as a big shield uh, spinning out around us, uh, that, that we might have a few very specific things that happen here on Earth. That means other worlds like Earth and life as we know it might be very rare. Now, they weren't arguing that life is rare, but rather life as we know it could be very rare. Uh, and so there have been a lot of arguments, a lot of debates about whether or not we should accept that. Um, and I'm still kind of on the fence myself with some of their arguments, That's but it, it is an interesting argument to make because of some very specific things about our solar system. But honestly, I would wait a few more years and see if we start finding other star systems yeah. like our own, because we probably will. Yeah. What is it, we know all about solar systems because we live in one? <laughs> <laughs> but again, we have that n equals one problem of solar systems like ours right now. We may eventually have other ones. Exactly. Um, so I think, yeah, it's running after 9 o'clock right now. I think it's probably a good time for me to finish up. Um, so thank you all for having me here. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.